Yes, happy to remove it. We'll do that. Uh, there was something else I was doing. Just very quickly doing the register. Right, just checking. Yes, we've got our virtual team as well, which is good to see. Good to see you all. All right. So the code for the session was 47GIB. 47GIB. Right. And you should end up somewhere there. Somewhere there. All right. So we've been discussing this idea of perfect competition, one end of this the spectrum, monopolists, the other end of the spectrum, and what a monopolist might be and what it might be. What might happen if we have a monopoly? Right. Okay. Now, if I move on, just one more. We might say that maybe there is a pos yes. Hello. Right, so there are some possible advantages to having a monopoly. So even though they're at that extreme end, they are not competitive. Governments will try and smash them. Maybe we can say they're okay in part. And when you're writing in your examinationing, one of the key skills you need to do, and it's something you're familiar with, particularly if you've done GPing, right? is doing something called a balanced argument, where it's not all bad, there are some goods. It's not all disadvantages, there are some advantages. Yeah? So for a monopoly, well, hey, they're gonna provide us with some research and development. They might be innovative, they might come up with new products, new ways of doing things, things we hadn't thought of before. It might be that because they are a monopoly, they're actually competitive internationally. Now, it might be that they're a monopoly locally within the country, but internationally, there's a lot of competition. So, a case in point in New Zealand uh, is this company here. It's been a little while since I've had to remember its name. Right, called Fonterra. It does not sell fonts on the computer. No. No, no, no. Okay. Yes. And cheese. It is one of the world's largest. Thank you. Look, one of the world. One of the world's largest dairy companies. Uh, and because it is one company in New Zealand, it is considered a monopoly. But internationally, it's actually yeah, competing with other companies. By the way, do you know the biggest one? Nestle. Yeah. All right, so that's the Fonterra. Now we can take a bit of an aside. Do you want to take a bit of a side route at this point? We'll keep going. Side. Side route. Let's go back to Frontier. All right, so Frontier, as we said, it was a monopoly in New Zealand. All right. But, 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 all right, it is also another type of market structure as well. It is also called a Mon Sony. Now, yes, it took me a while to learn how to pronounce that particular word. 
right? At the end of the day, figured it out, monopsony, which again does sound like the banana nut song. Exactly. Yeah? Tick tock, here we come. Right. Now, it, it is what a monopsony is, is somewhat different. It's still a monopoly, but it's a monopoly based on uh, a particular product, right? So, say for example, uh, you've got, so they're a monopoly with regards to the sale of milk. Yeah? But they are a monopsony with regards to the milk product that is produced. So there are a lot of, in New Zealand, a lot of milk producers, and they themselves are very competitive. Right. But they're all producing milk. It's very homogenous, which is quite ironic for milk when you think about it. Yeah? Yes. 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 All right. That's a good way to explain it. Absolutely. So it depends on which lens you're looking. Okay. So if you're looking from a consumer point of view, the only way you're going to get milk and cheese in New Zealand is, is Fonterra. All right, they're, they're the monopoly. But if you're looking from a producer point of view, all the hundreds of farmers that there are, there are a few less than there used to be, all right, the dairy farmers, but still there is a lot, okay? Then they have to deal more or less exclusively with Ontario. So it is a monopoly buying their product. Yeah. Now it might be that the product that the people are selling is labor, okay? So you can have monopsonies that are trade unions, for example, because the only way you're going to get to be, say, a doctor is if you're officially registered and licensed through a medical board. Yeah? The only way you are legally allowed to practice law in America, uh, right? is if you apply and go through a certification process through one particular body. So they are the only people dealing with that. That's a monopsony. Monopsony is not like a tag of any, like, no. but it's like the market Yes. And that's why it's kind of an aside. All right. Now, I'm not expecting you to be asked questions about monopsonies, but it is useful to have that as an understanding so that you can see that what we're in, in essence saying is that it depends which viewpoint you look at as to whether it's monopoly or not. Okay. But I thought Fonterra was a good example of that because they fall into that particular category there. Monopolies can help support other businesses. Those businesses may not then necessarily need to make a profit, as the monopoly is. And then, of course, there's the big one, which we're going to come back to. The idea of economies of scale. We've hinted at this before, where we talked about monopolies can be so big that one of the barriers to entering the market could be economies of scale. Just because of the size that they have, they are able to have lower costs right, on average than pretty much anybody else. So if you were to try to set up shop doing that particular business, you wouldn't be able to. Right? Well, how can they do it? Well, because they're that big. Yeah. So Joel might want to start up his own airline. Either Joel. Yeah. Why don't you, Joel? And uh, a 
a lot of money. Yeah, I don't know about you, but to be honest, I don't think I've got enough in the piggy bank to buy an airplane. Yeah, I mean, you might. I, I don't know. Yeah. So there can be economies of scale that can occur, and they're going to be a significant advantage economically. And that's something that we can think about in the future, but as well. So are monopolies good? What do you think? Have a guess. Have a guess. Have an opinion. Have a guess. They're always bad. Oh, sorry, Sheriff, I didn't get rid of your other name. Probably do that. I need to leave the real people. Right. Okay, so the majority of us feel oh, monopolists to some degree are okay. Now that's kind of the point of this. Right? The point isn't to be absolutely labeling them one way or the other. The point is to try to be balanced in your approach. Say in this aspect, eh, not so keen on it, but this aspect, maybe that's quite good. Yeah. Here we go, bit, bit of a research for you. You might know this already. Y, K, K, what do they make? Tetra pack, that might be an obvious one. What do they make? Mapuche. What are they making? Yep, they're real life examples, real life businesses. Some you've probably never heard of before. But I don't know that you've heard of any of them. Yes. So you know how you buy the, the UHT milk in the cartons? All of those cartons are made by Tetra Pak. All of them. The little orange juice packets. What about YKK? Who knows that one? Anybody found that one? The zipper company. The ones that make your zips. All of them. I'm not saying there aren't other businesses out there that possibly have the same technology or ability, but this is the biggest company. And Mabuchi, anybody found them? Yes. Right. And they're pretty much the only ones who do it. Well, you know how it is, it's theory, yeah? As close as we can get is what we're going to get, yeah? They're not the only ones. I thought those were good examples because I, I figured a number of you probably wouldn't have heard of them. I did think one or two of you might have. I thought, oh, they might have heard of this one. Yeah, and I thought that that would be quite good because you may have never heard of them. So, can you find a real life example where a government has attempted to destroy a monopoly or just regulate one? Go.
checking that you're all so socially distanced. In my way, you're wandering around. It's okay if you can't, we can come up with an example for you. Absolutely fine. Yeah, good work, Joel. If you sorry, this is Joel. The company that Alexander Graham Bell found. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Good. Break up of standard oil. Well done, Max. Good work, Sam. It's a lot more common than you think. But we also need to consider that governments are looking at trying to reduce, restrict eliminate monopoly practices. So it may be that the government is regulating against a business that is just behaving like a monopoly. Well done, Lisa, absolutely right. What does AT and T stand for? You know, Amer American Telephone and Telegraph. And why is AT and T so significant as a business? And who, who basically created the company? Joel told you before. Alexander Graham Bell. Yeah. The Bell Telephone Company. The guy who invented the telephones. And all of a sudden it was decided having a monopoly wasn't a good idea on telephones, so they smashed them and they created the baby bells. The so Northern Bell, Southern Bell, or no, Eastern Bell. And AT&T. But then over time, they all started getting back together again, reforming the band, so to speak. There's a, a, I don't know how much time you have sort of in your time, but there is a documentary that got produced a few years ago uh, called The Men Who Built America. And it does have a lot of the backgrounds of these sorts of monopolies and the monopoly smashing that went on. Uh, and there are some quite fascinating caricatures within them. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the guy who created Stanford Oil, the Rockefeller guy, all right, he was a nutcase, all right, bit of a giant of a man. Yeah. But yeah, quite scary. 
And what is quite interesting is that some of the people that they ask opinions on these business titans, as they're known, right, were people that you will know. One of which is hopefully going to be issued rather rapidly out of the White House. Maybe with someone's foot in your own. So it does get a bit cringeworthy, perhaps, when they ask him about a business person. Right. Okay. Yes, good. Well done. Oh, that's a good one, Fatima. Now, the reason why finding these real life examples is good is because in your exam, case studies. Yeah. Now, what I've said to learners in the past is this I can't guarantee what case studies your examiner is going to create. Yeah. It used to be in the in the old days, right? Yes, I'm an old man, right? That we used to make you read the newspaper. And then you'd have to do a, like a report on the news you know, <laughs> class. Yes, I know. Terrible, I know. All right? But the point of that was to get you up to date with what was going on. Yeah? Because there is a chance, I know it's a small one, but there is a chance that the very case study you look at as a real-life example for some of your theories could be used in an exam. Yeah? Particularly if you're thinking historical ones, as opposed to more recent ones. Okay? Your exam, you're going to be sitting at next year. Yes. Am I right on that? Yeah. Now, it won't have been written yet. The outline of it will be there. So pretty much the threads of the different case studies will be being pulled together. So at some point, it's, there's got to be, the law of large numbers has to be that someone somewhere in the world who sits economics, because there's like 18,000 of you around the world, okay? Someone must have studied the exact case study that turns up in the exam. It, it has to happen, surely. All right? Either in an IA or in just doing the research and putting it into your work. Or they've done it as part of their EE, or you know, or just general, right? General revision. So that's why these sorts of things are really quite important to have a go at. Add real life into your theory. Now, oh, -ho! even more fun. Just because you thought it wasn't fun enough, let's add the Friday fun. Oligopoly. I've told you economics has all the best words. Yeah? Believe it or not, there actually is a board game called Oligopoly. Just as there's a board game called Monopoly. And yes, again, going back a long time in the past, we used to get the students to play Oligopoly in the class. Yes. The board game. Yeah? So if you are a fan of the board game Monopoly, you will really like the board game Oligopoly because it's like Monopoly but on steroids. Okay? And the economics of it is really good because it matches up with the theory of Oligopoly in economics. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm highlighting where it is because I'm suggesting to you it's actually quite close to a Monopoly. It's not a Monopoly, but it's close. And it's got perhaps a cooler, cooler name. It does have certain key characteristics, certain key features. All right. One of those is that there's only a few of them. And that kind of brings it towards that monopoly end. You can't have a lot of businesses doing it. Okay, there's got to be just a few. But if there's only a few of them, in order for them to have that sort of monopoly-esque edge to them, 
they've got to be big. So you're talking about a few large businesses. They have market power. They actually are able to set the price. All right. Oligopolies, from an economics point of view, are much more interesting to research and analyze than monopolies. Because there's more than one of them. And because they're going to engage in particular practices that are quite interesting. One of which won a Nobel Prize. All right. Mm -hmm. okay. And the movie was done about it. And, yeah. They do have this here. They're going to have a pretty homogenous product. Again, like a monopolist. And you would expect that because the more differentiated the product is going to be, the more competitive it will be. So you're going to expect them to be quite homogenous. Uh, I've, I've used just abbreviations there, so I apologize if you don't know what E and E stands for. All right? It's not Eeny, as in Eeny, Meeny, Miny, Mo. Right? No. It is barriers to entry and exit. There are barriers, and they're going to be quite big. Now, I used the airline example just a little while ago with Joel. Anybody know how many major international airlines there are in the world? How many? Three. There's a little bit more than three. A little bit less than 20. Alright. <laughs> now, a while back, an economist wrote an article that suggested that the entire aviation market internationally had enough capacity for there to be a maximum of seven international carriers in the world. That's it. There are more than seven and less than 20. Yeah. Seven. Now, what you have seen is you have seen over the past airlines merging with each other, airlines being bought out by other airlines. It happens. And so, yeah, you can guess that that's possibly where it's going to go. Maybe. I don't know. There's, there's an airline that's quite close to here, Malaysian Airlines. Yeah. Now, it's not in the news a lot at the moment for fairly obvious reasons. Because it's, they don't do a lot at the moment. Okay. But for the last few years, the Malaysian government has been pushing money into the business. Why? They don't want it to be bought out by Air Asia. Absolutely. Right? Whether it stays as a viable airline or not is a real concern for the Malaysian government. It is such a concern for the Malaysian government that they've actually had a, a CEO change just about every year, I think, since we've been here. Right? So it is something that governments consider, and it's something that you can see. So the airline industry, what about, let's stay with the airline industry, how many companies actually manufacture airlines, um, airplanes? Yeah, don't do the fingers. <laughs> yes, I was being to. Yes. Two. That's it. Two. Today's lesson is brought to you by Red Bull. Now, yes, what are the names of the two companies? Go. Virgin and no. No. I'm talking about companies that build airplanes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Companies that build airplanes. Yes. No, they build air um, the engines. Oh, yes. yes. Boeing is one, and who's the other one? Airbus is the other. That's it. Boeing, which which country owns Boeing? Do we know which country owns Boeing? America. Which country owns Airbus? No. It's Europe. It's European. Airbus is European. Yeah. Now... That's a bit about what do they call it, a transatlantic sort of rivalry between the two. 
But that's it. They are the two leading manufacturers of airplanes in the world. That's it. All right, until Joel sets his company up. What else have we got there? We've got a potential for, don't tell Donald. What are you doing if you are colluding? <laughs> Rockstar, well done. Yes. If you are colluding, you are working together. But not collaborating, because that's another way to say working together, but colluding has a bit of a, a what, you know, how words mean, what is it, denotation? Connotation? Yes. Connotation? I don't know, you're T-O-K people, can figure it out, yeah? Uh, when people say somebody is colluding, it sounds evil, nasty, wrong. Whereas if somebody said they're cooperating with each other, collaborating with each other, it doesn't. But essentially it's the same idea, yeah? Now, there's a very famous economics quote from Adam Smith who says that when businesses get together, right, not talking about getting together to work on a project, but just get together to hang out sort of socially, no good will come of it sort of idea. That the only reason for them to even be in the same room with each other basically is to collude. Right? We don't want that. Nasty word. Scary. Yeah. So governments will be looking for collusion, and they can be very subtle with it. Uh, you're familiar with a business called, um, let me think, uh, Shell. Yeah, what does Shell sell? Which isn't easy to say, particularly on a Friday morning. Yes, they do. Oil, gas, petrol. Yeah. Shell sells by the sea shore. Now, Um, yes. In New Zealand, there was a big scandal with Shell. Okay? Because Shell and some of the other petrol companies were secretly coordinating part of their special offers. All right? So I don't know if you've ever gone into a petrol station. Some petrol stations have things like loyalty cards. Some petrol stations have, you know, buy one, get one free. Some petrol stations have all sorts of like special discounts that you get little coupons and it gets you discounts off of your price of your petrol. Yeah, that sort of an idea. Now, what petrol stations were doing in New Zealand was they were sort of like subtly ringing each other up and going, oh, hey, bro, hey. We're losing money on this. How about we get rid of that special deal? And the other petrol station go, oh yeah, sounds good. And they get rid of it. But they were coordinating the activity between the two. Now that got found out that is illegal in New Zealand. Maybe not in other parts of the world. Don't know. I haven't tested the law everywhere. Okay. And therefore the companies got fined which doesn't mean they're okay, it means they got told off and charged money. Okay? Naughty. Yeah? Okay? Now, it's, there's, there's weird things like <clears throat> that you know, I know about because I'm, I'm a very old man, but there's a company called BP, which you might be familiar with. Yes, it used to be called British Petroleum, and then people got a bit upset because it's the word British, yeah, so it's BP. Then people got a bit upset because it wasn't environmentally friendly, and they kept crashing their oil tankers into things that and leaking oil, right? So then they used the marketing tagline beyond petroleum, okay? You know, all of those sorts of things. Well, at one point in time, and this is weird. Now, I don't know if they deliberate, I don't know how you deliberately arrange this. But at one point in time, the worldwide spokesperson for BP 
was a woman and her name was BP. How do you arrange that? Spooky. It wasn't, it was spelled B E E P E E. Or something similar to that. That was her name. I think she pronounced it Beppy. Like, dude, weird. That'd be like Mr. Mr. Griffith naming one of his children Nexus. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't that? I'd like to introduce my daughter, Nexus. Yeah. This is my son, Taylor. Right? <laughs> anyway, all right. So collusion is something we're going to be looking for with a microscope. That's not a microscope, that's a magnifying glass. But we're going to look for that, and when we find it, naughty. Okay? Now, we can also see competition, we can, in, a, in an oligopoly. Because there's more than one. They can actually compete, but they tend not to compete with price. They tend to compete with what's called non-price. What's non-price? Yeah, so they're competing by means that are not price. That's it. So, yeah, which means that there's an entire world of possibilities so long as it's got nothing to do with price. Yeah? For example, I mean, look, I've got a little wee part of my brain that's a marketing brain because that's, you know, former life and everything. Yeah? But in New Zealand, the thing to do was to have a local celebrity come along to your business. Usually in New Zealand, it's rugby players, okay? You've got to figure that, yeah? All right? Although nowadays, one of the biggest celebrities is Stephen Adams. You get him coming along and, woof, all right? You got to, the whole world will take pay attention, yeah. So it'll be the equivalent of I don't know uh, Dane turning up to your service station and opening the new service station and all the camera crew and everyone's there and oh look we've got a new step well, Let's go to that service station because Dane goes to it. Non-price competition. Yeah. Do you know what a manu is? Do I know what a manu? Manu yeah. in New Zealand. Well, Manu was a, a name. Oh, it was okay. Yeah. In, in New Zealand, um, Manu was a, a, a Maori name. You have kids called Manu. Um, it's a, it would be a very old name. It's kind of like the old English names, like, I say Harriet, but we've got a teacher here called Harriet. Mm -hmm. uh, Abigail and um, Esther. Okay, we had an Esther here too. Um, those sort of really older English names, yeah? Um, Manu was the equivalent, but in Maori. Yeah? So much so that there was a children's television show where the principal, or play school, okay? And the presenter would sit on the floor with the toys and bring the toys out and they would all be named. This was Big Ted, that was his name. This was Little Ted, that was his name. And this was the doll and the doll was named Manu. Yes, it was a Maori doll. Yeah, okay. Through the doors, through the windows, where are we, play school. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember things. Yeah, not everything, but some things. Right. So, and again, with marketing, it's just that simple. And we talked about it a lot in previous schools, um, and I've talked about it here. It's that idea of having a point of difference, because you've got a homogenous product. So what you need to have is anything that's different, right? And you use that as your the focus of your marketing. Yeah. We've got bigger spaces to park your car. You know. Yeah. Yeah. In Thailand, if you've never been to Thailand, uh, the shopping malls have different spaces for the, the 
the car parks for the cars. They're different sizes. Yeah, because in Thailand, if you haven't been there, it is well. Don't go there now, but you know it's well worth going at some point in the future when the world is you know happier. Okay. Um, some people in Thailand drive tanks with wheels the size of giraffe. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so they need car parks that big. I'm not kidding. That big car parks. And then other people in Thailand drive cars that are smaller than a Maybe. And so then they have the, the little. So they've actually divided up their car parks in the shopping mall based on the size of the car. Right? And they're color coded them. Right? And they have, in one of the shopping malls we used to sit, that we used to go to, right? Uh, it was quite good because I would get my wife to go in with me because we would then be able to park on the pink floor because all of the car parks were painted pink. And the reason why they were painted pink was these were the car parks that were specifically designed for women. Not kidding. All right? And the reason why is because they were the ones that were the closest to the door. <laughs> the shopping mall. So therefore it was women and women with children. That's where you parked. Which is quite a, a nice sort of idea. But again, it's that point of difference. Because then you know that, that you're able to do that there. So you would go there as opposed to somewhere else where it's just like a, a gravel pit. And, oh, where do I go? What do I, where do I? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So anything that gives you an edge, anything that's different, right? and we've talked about this before, you creating your own difference. Yeah. Uh, I I did this in Thailand. We had an economics teachers conference in Thailand that um, me and my compatriot ran for economics teachers around the Asian region, and they all came and they they came to our school and we talked through stuff and it was quite fun, and we got them to teach some of our kids, which was a real eye-opener for them. <laughs> it was, yeah? But one of the things I said to them is, look, look, we're in Southeast Asia, okay? We're teaching, we're all pretty much expats, yeah? And what would you do, you know? If, if money was no object, what would you do as a teacher? You know, oh, I'd take a class trip to America and I'd go to this, then I'd, yeah? And they all sat down and th thought about it and then said, okay, scale it to what you would do in Asia. Right. And I said, look, one of the things I've always wanted, because I thought it was cool, is an LED sign. Like, well, why not? And it could be scrolling economics across it. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah. And so I went and my wife and I bought her and we put it up in the classroom in Thailand. And it became a point of difference. And the teachers looked, oh, how did you get that? Where did you get it? How much what did, what did you, yeah? And then we were able to use that. And then in the photos that I take of the classroom, quite often I'll put that, you know, that, I'll wait until there's a word scrolling across because it's a point of difference. It's something other people don't have. And that's what you look for in these sorts of non-price-based competitive things. Yes, my marketing brain tends to go all the time. Yeah? All right. Now, this one we're going to do a bit more explaining about. All right? So don't panic too much. You just need to note it down at this point, and then we will see what it means later on. For an oligopolist, you have an average cost curve, which we're going to look at. Panic. But it's going to look slightly different to other average cost curves that we're going to look at. In that, it's going to look more like a saucer. Not the flying kind, more like the kind that you'd put down with milk for your cat. A bowl. It's going to look more like a, a, a flat bowl. Saucer. Yeah? Not, I put the tomato sauce on, I'm going to, therefore my job is, I'm a saucer. Put the tomato sauce on, put it on again, I'm a resourcer. Right, okay. You like that one? Yeah. Uh, we
We tend to say that the buyers are small and the producers are large. Please don't take offense in any of that, right? But that's what we tend to say. These companies are very big companies, right? If you look at the size of some of the biggest companies in the world, yeah, I know we've now got the Apples and the Amazons. I know that. But before the Apples and the Amazons, some of the biggest companies in the world were oil companies. Yeah? Some of the biggest companies in the world still currently, but not obviously not up there to the Apples and Amazons, are, are banks. Well, how many banks are there? I mean, think, think about how many banks you know of in Malaysia. Can you count more than 10? Sure. Right. I counted, and I could only get up to, I think, five. There's actually quite a lot of banks in Malaysia in comparison to some countries. Go to New Zealand. There's like three. And they're all Australian. <laughs> no, they're not. There's one that's New Zealand. Guess what it's called? Kiwi Bank, you know. Yeah. It's a version of the same bank. Yes. However, something that's really interesting, and this is something that um, I'm wanting to do some research into when I've got like five seconds, which isn't now. Not now, right? Uh, is actually Islamic finance. Because that's something this country does that no other country other than Islamic countries do. So as an economics idea, you've got it right here at your doorstep. There is international finance, Islamic finance articles and journals and conferences here in Malaysia. Yeah, I got invited to one the other week, right? Month. Also. Right? But it is something that's different. Again. So if you are thinking I'm going to write an economics paper about something that's different, Islamic finance, it's, it's, it's different. But I don't know enough about it, right? So I want to learn more about it. I know some of the histories of it, but I would be much more interested to know a little bit more of the ins and outs and how it actually works. So I will do some research into that at some point in the future. But again, that's, that's because... From an economics point of view, you're finding something that's different. You can then use that as part of your career. Right? I know about this. Yeah, just like in the past when nobody knew about global warming, okay, and climate change, people were able to use the economics of climate change as something that they were world experts in. Point of difference. Right? Which is why my lecturer at university got flown all the way to New York to the United Nations to talk to them about climate change change, right? Specifically about the cap and trade model because he was a worldwide expert in it. So those sorts of things, yeah. Right. Now, have a little bit more thinking here. Oligopolies, we said that there's going to be a possibility of collusion. The products themselves, they we, there's not a lot of differentiation amongst them. They're homogenous. Okay? There are barriers to entry. The firms, now this is an important one, even though we say they're close to a monopoly, they're not. So the firms themselves are actually independent, but they can interdepend. Is that a word? Yeah? They are affected by the other businesses. Yeah? Just like you all. Okay? There's two to three of you at a table, sometimes one, right? Let's say there's more than one of you at a table, right? And you know this, if you've ever sat in a room with people and somebody sits at the table, like my son does sometimes, and he'll sit at the table. Yeah? You are affected by what they're doing. 
So these businesses, there might be five of them, there might be six of them, there might be ten of them, but they're actually affected by the decisions that the other businesses make. Right? At the moment, what my son does is he kicks the table leg and it causes the whole table to shake. So we're sitting there eating. Why is the table shaking? How do you stop kicking the table? I'm not doing that. Okay. And the table starts shaking again. So therefore, okay, Max's business needs to consider what Nisa's business is doing before it makes it, its decisions. Because that's going to be affected by what Nisa's business does. Which is going to bring in something really cool in a minute. I'll say in a minute. In a minute. All right. We've also got this idea here of what's called a concentration ratio. That isn't what you do in class. My dad told me I needed to focus. Right. It talks about how big each individual firm is in comparison to the industry. Yeah. So even though there might be four of the businesses, five of the businesses, seven of the businesses, however many, all right, they're not all equally big. Some are bigger than others. Yeah. So you've got to work out how big each individual firm is. And then the other thing that you can do is you can say, well, maybe there's other outside of these five, maybe there are other businesses, but they're just really small. Yeah. So these businesses occupy more than 50% of the industry. Does that make sense? So therefore they are the core group that everybody refers to. We talked about cell phones, the Apples, the Huawei's, the Samsung exploding ones. All right. Then, then, I don't know. Yeah. But if you look at the percentages of the market, Apple, Samsung, Huawei, they own the market. There's very little left for the others. That's what you're talking about. But even within that group, some are going to be bigger than others. Right, so have, one, go, have a go explaining a feature of an oligopolist. How many energy drink manufacturers are there? Less than anything. There was a big scandal because Coca-Cola decided to get into the energy drink market. And Coca-Cola previously had a written agreement with another, with an energy drink company called Monster, that it wasn't going to get into the energy drink industry. So there was a court case about that. That they, they ruled in Coke's favor. Coca-Cola have got more money than most countries. Told you how much money Coca-Cola have, eh? Okay. All right. Well, if you're a business learner in the room, if you're interested in marketing, yeah. About five years ago, Coca-Cola increased their marketing budget just for normal Coca-Cola by one billion US dollars. One billion with a B. 
which meant that the total marketing budget just for ordinary Coca-Cola, not all of the rest of the varieties that they have, amounted to six billion US dollars. It is a global company and they're able to spend six billion US dollars marketing one of their product line. You want a job in marketing, dude? That's how you do it. How easy is it to market Coca-Cola? I mean, come on. You want it? Yep. Here you go. I discovered the other day that Red Bull has actually got less caffeine in it than a Starbucks coffee. No, it doesn't have much at all. In fact, according to dietitians who apparently studied this stuff, Red Bull, you could consume five cans of Red Bull to get the equivalent of one and a quarter cup of coffee from Starbucks. That's how much caffeine is in those Starbucks coffees. <laughs> All right, let's have a look. Yes, good. Good. Yep. Well done. Good people. Winhow here. You having a go, Winhow? Good man. All right. So as I said to you before, they're gonna they're not working. Remember, collusion is illegal, but they're still gonna have to try because there's only a few of them, because they've all got market power. They are going to work almost together. They're going to react to each other. They're going to have to. Yeah. There's a uh, basketball coaching strategy called read and react, okay, which is working out what the other team is doing and reacting to that. It's what we used to run in one of our schools that we were in. It's the same basic idea. You're seeing what they're doing and you react to that. So if they change their prices, so what did I say here? They reduce their prices, the other businesses are going to follow. Why? Right. Why, if Fatima's company reduces their prices, why would Max's company do the same? Yes. Yes, then his customers will go Whoop, to you because you've got a homogenous product. Yeah. So you've made a point of difference by dropping your price because you have price control. So you can do that. What that means in reality is that the prices tend to be quite rigid, they don't tend to move very much because as soon as one of them moves, the others will follow. Uh, yeah. Yeah. All right, so you would expect the prices not to change very much, and you would expect that if the prices did change, that they would follow each other. Now, again, this is why economists like studying these more than monopolies, because there's nothing happening with the monopolies. But with these guys, it's like, are they going to change their price? What happened to it? Oh, oh they changed it. Now the others change. Yeah? There's something to analyze. And it can be quite fun. So they tend to, because prices don't change, the way they tend to be, as said, is through non-price ways. And that... Okay, a little bit more. Right, so if we move further to the competitive end of the spectrum, the next structure that we see is this one. It is monopolistic. Monopolistic competition. 
you do have to be careful with this because this is where learners get confused between a monopoly and monopolistic competition. They're different, as we're going to see. We also see, because I've highlighted it, that they're close to this end of the spectrum, that they are more competitive than they are not competitive. All right? So I used to say that you take one step from here and you end up here, you take one step from here and you end up here. To sort of give you that idea. All right, here's a quick question for you based on the material we've just covered. How small could an oligopoly be? Yes, well done, good sir. Gosh, you're a rock star. Well done. I, I usually get the wrong answer for that, but yes, well done. Why? Because if there was only one, there's a monopoly. Well done, good sir. What do you call it, do you think? What would you call an oligopoly if there was only two businesses? Yes, a duopoly. Well done. Very good. Absolutely, and as we talked about the airplane manufacturers, for example, there are two of them. So you would classify them as an oligopoly, but the smallest type of oligopoly, a duopoly. Whereas monopolistic competitors, they're closer to perfectly competitive. So that means there's going to be a lot of them. Now, in theory, it should mean they're competitive. But we're going to have a bit of a caveat with that. We're going to have a bit of a disclaimer with that. But what we're going to say is that they have got a small share of the market. They may not be as competitive as you think. But there are lots of them. There are, for a monopolistically competitive firm, again, think about how close they are to perfect competition because for them there's also no real barriers to entry or exit so that should make them quite competitive but we're going to find maybe they're not as competitive as we first thought there is going to be product differentiation so there's a difference because our perfectly competitive firm was homogenous products were the same. For a monopolistically competitive firm, there are differences. Now the differences might be small. If you have a look right in the list, it might be that there's a physical difference in the product, but that physical difference might just be the quality of it. That's all. It might be that it's the location. It might be the different services that they offer, or it might be the sort of the branding, the image that they have. I put some real life examples down there. You might be able to come up with others as well. I've talked about book publishing, clothing, shoes. Thinking retail, jewelry stores, furniture stores, hairdressers. Yeah. You guys know this. You could also put restaurants in there. Not all, but some. Yeah, hotels potentially. What we're going to find is that quite often they're monopolistically competitive because of this. All right. That's where you get to ask the question, why do you go to that shop? Well, because it's the one near me. Yeah, remember that behavioral economics example all the way back where they talked about would you go to the shop that's further away from you if they were offering a, a cheaper price? And you'd say no. 
important. Yeah. This is my local. I always go to it. It's the one near me. It's the one that offers me a good service. It's the one that knows you. Yeah. It's like my son's favorite restaurant or one of them. Right? And you know IOI shopping mall? Yeah. In IOI shopping mall, his favorite restaurant. And we, not all the time, because they have different people on there. But if we were to go there and the people who know us are there, would you like your usual? Hi, how are you? Come on, come in. Uh, would you like your usual? Yes, okay. Excellent. Have a seat. Yes, we're quite good to this. So services could make them a bit different. When you think about restaurants, there's hundreds of the things. But what makes them different? Why do so many people queue outside of some restaurants? Like with the, the Korean hot pot ones. What's going on with that? It's like you're queuing for soup. Why? Oh, I don't know, the hot pot ones. This is, it, it is, honestly, it's like you, you walk past and it's like a queue of people. Going, and then other restaurants nearby that are empty. And you're going, I would like a bowl of warm soup, please. I would like to put my own food in my soup. Yay! Uh, hey. Don't understand. Lots of things I don't understand. Right. So a monopolistically competitive firm is likely to that there are a number of them, but there's perhaps one that you go to regularly. So they become your monopoly. Yeah, they're a monopoly for you. You always go, you go to that hairdresser. You don't go to any other hairdresser. They don't know you're here. They don't treat you right. Uh, obviously, at the moment, you're all getting cut, your haircuts at home. Right, with mum with the crippers. <laughs> right. That's what my wife does. <laughs> there you go, done. Oh, she has done the last few times, yeah. You don't go, we don't go to hairdressers, it's just that. You know. Right. So, we talked about how this bit here was the big difference between a monopolistically competitive firm and a perfectly competitive firm. That was going to be a big difference. This is different. They do have some control over price because they can act as a local monopoly. Yeah. Uh, you know, UK people, people who live in the UK will talk about going to their local pub. Well, there are lots of them. A bar. Sorry, I use the word pub. Bar. Is there another word for that? No? You understand what I mean if I say pub? Bar? Apparently, when I say bar, people get confused and they think I'm talking about shit. Yeah. Yeah, like a local monopoly. So in one area, this is the monopoly. This is where you go. Okay. Yeah. So, so they can actually be a monopoly in the market anyway, but yes. that is, it is the monopoly in that particular area. Yes. So, for example, how many international schools are there in Petra Dryer? So, yeah. Or of a monopolistically competitive model, perhaps? Yes. All right. Whereas the high school I went to in, in the wilds of Palmerston North, there was another high school, a competing high school, over the fence. 
Yeah, yeah, they, they were a competing high school. Let's just say that. All right. When my when I left my high school, I did leave eventually. I stayed forever. Yeah. Um, the role at the school just went whoosh by that. It wasn't because of me, as you were thinking. All right. But it did. It just dropped tremendously. It dropped so much that there, at the end, there were more adults in the school than there were learners. All right? So the school across the fence <coughs> said, tell you what, we'll buy the whole lot. They didn't. They weren't allowed, by law, to do that in New Zealand. Because right? that would have created a monopoly in that area. Because one of the other quirky things about education in New Zealand, which if I was in charge, I would get rid of, Right? Is that you're legally allowed, you're legally obliged in New Zealand to go to the school nearest you. So there are what's called little regions. So if you live in that region, you have to go to those schools. You can apply to go to a school out of your region, but they have no obligation to accept you. Yeah. So therefore, it would reduce the number of schools within that region if it took over and it would become a monopoly therefore the government said no you can't do that so the school had to struggle on and try and figure out how to survive as a school which it did by adding adult education classes and it kept going and eventually built up its school role again right ladies and gentlemen we're going to stop there for the day you've done some really good work uh well done we will carry on with this next week Exciting week next week, All right? Um, pink stuff for the desks, blue stuff for the hands. You've got new towels, fantastic. Otherwise, as we'd send the land of my birth and point it up, which means goodbye for now. Have a fantastic day, good weekend. Get some sleep, drink lots of water, stay safe, stay away from people. All right. Bye.